all of the energy in the sun comes from thermonuclear reactions. Now, this is pretty widely known, but in this video, we're going to explore this process in a little bit more detail. So to recall, the photosphere is the only part of the sun that we can really see, you might say. So in other words, we cannot peer any deeper into the atmosphere, but we've been able to deduce pretty much the processes that go on inside of the sun. But let's take a look inside the core and try to understand the process of nuclear fusion. Recall that temperature is just the manifestation of something called thermal motion. Uh, thermal motion means that as the temperature goes up, particles move around faster and faster. Now, if the two particles are, say, protons, and they carry a positive charge, well, then normally they would rather repel each other via electric repulsion. But the temperatures inside the core, as well as the pressures, are both high enough to overcome this tendency to repel, and you get what's called fusion. And fusion is the manifestation of Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared, where energy is equivalent to the mass multiplied by the speed of light squared. So this turns into this. We have protons coming together, they fuse, and they unleash energy in the process. Uh, the energy is carried away uh, in the form of gamma photons, but some new particles are formed in the process. And about 4 million tons of hydrogen are burned into helium every second at the core of the sun. So let's take a look at this process in a little bit more detail. This is called the proton-proton chain. So we begin with four protons, and we're going to arrange them in two pairs. So if we get each of the pairs of protons to fuse, you produce what's called deuterium. A deuterium is an isotope of hydrogen. It's still one proton, and if this were an atom, it would have just one electron, but it also has a neutron in its nucleus as well. But in addition to the deuterium nuclei, a positron and a neutrino are produced. Now the positrons are eventually going to react with an electron. And so when matter and antimatter react together, energy is produced. So two gamma photons are produced in this way. Now the two deuterium nuclei will eventually fuse with a hydrogen nucleus, producing helium-3 as well as a gamma photon. And the two helium-3 nuclei will fuse together to produce helium-4 and also produce two hydrogen nuclei as well. So these two hydrogen nuclei are going to fuse again into deuterium and they will react with other deuterium nuclei. Electrons and positrons are going to fuse together, releasing gamma photons, neutrinos are going to be released, and so on and so on. And the process just repeats itself. It's kind of like a chain reaction. So this is known as the proton-proton chain, and it's responsible for about 85% of the sun's energy. So when we step back and we think about all of this energy that's being produced in the core, there's another consideration. There's the gravity of all of the material bearing down on the core. So if the core wasn't producing energy, the star would implode upon itself. And this would be true of our sun. This would be true of all stars. However, the energy results in a pressure that's exerted against the otherwise infalling material of the sun. And so we have a balance of the two forces of gravity and pressure. We call this hydrostatic equilibrium. So if the sun is producing gamma rays in the core, why then does it radiate at all of these other wavelengths? I mean, we should have been gamma rayed to death a long time ago, and yet we get very few gamma rays coming from the sun. As a matter of fact, most of the electromagnetic radiation generated by the sun is in the visible part of the spectrum, so what gives? Well, it is true that everything that is radiated from the core initially radiates as a gamma ray. However, those gamma rays will quickly encounter a atom in somewhere in the radiative zone of the sun. That atom's electron will absorb that gamma ray, and the electron will eventually release a photon in, when it returns to its original energy state. But that photon may emerge as an X-ray. It may have a little bit less energy now until it gets reabsorbed again and re-emitted again, perhaps as a far ultraviolet photon. 
But then once it gets reabsorbed and re-emitted a few times, it may now emerge in a random direction as an ultraviolet photon, maybe eventually gets reabsorbed and re-emitted as a visible photon. So this is a process called radiative diffusion. And this has the effect of diluting the gamma radiation from the sun until eventually most of the radiation emerging from the photosphere comes out as visible light. Some of it comes out as infrared light, even radio, x-ray, ultraviolet, everything in between. So this random walk can take a long time. This can be anywhere from 10,000 to a million years. And so this is kind of interesting to know that the light that is coming from the sun is ancient. It was forged in the core of the sun maybe up to a million years ago. Now, this is true of a photon, of the gamma photons that are produced. But remember those neutrinos? Well, they just zip right on through. They don't interact with anything, or rather, they're what we call weakly interacting particles. They really don't knock into things very often. That's not to say they never knock into things, but it's an extremely rare occurrence. So neutrinos are forged in the core of the sun, and they just emerge right away. So... When we think about our photon being bottled up somewhere in the radiative zone for up to millions of years before eventually rising into the convective zone where it's brought up to the surface via convection, it is now free to escape once it reaches the photosphere into empty space. Neutrinos, on the other hand, just go right through. But how do we know this? Well, first of all, let's talk about how we know about the structure of the sun. We can take... Doppler imagery of the sun, and we know the sun is rotating. That means that the part that is rotating toward us is going to be blue shifted, while the part that's rotating away is going to be red shifted. But despite these two Doppler shifts, there are miniature Doppler shifts happening all the time. Uh, this is an example of Doppler imagery. So we can actually see or detect what parts of the surface are roiling as a result of vibrations in the sun. So this is helioseismology. This is a way of characterizing the interior layers of the sun by carefully analyzing the sun's vibrations. Now, how do we know that the sun is producing energy in its core in the way we described earlier via the proton-proton chain? Well, it turns out that we can detect neutrinos, but we have to construct very elaborate experiments in order to detect them. Remember, Neutrinos are very weakly interacting particles. So it isn't that they don't have any mass, it's just that they have very little mass, and only very rarely are they ever going to hit some other particle. So they escape the sun once created, and in order for us to detect them, we have to build our detectors deep underground. And this is because that in addition to neutrinos and light, there are other particles such as protons and plasma and so forth that are continuously raining down on the Earth. So we need to build our detectors deep underground so that we can block out all of those other particles and then let the neutrinos just come sailing through. Now these interactions are extremely rare, so what we have to do is fill up these huge chambers with ultra-pure water, and then surrounding the chamber are photomultiplier tubes. And the photomultiplier tube's job is to detect light and then amplify that signal and send that to a computer. So when one or more of these detectors detect a tiny flash of light produced by a neutrino knocking into a molecule of water, there's a tiny flash of light and detecting them confirms the nuclear fusion in the sun. This is how we know that our understanding of the sun's energy production is correct. The proton-proton chain predicts neutrinos, and we detect these neutrinos, albeit rarely. But how rare is rare? Well, here's an example. Here is the Boraxino neutrino detector in Italy. It has a volume of about 160,000 cubic centimeters. So it's a pretty large volume. And about 144 neutrinos per day were detected over 18 months. That's not to say that there weren't any neutrinos passing through except for just 144 a day. No, there were trillions and trillions of neutrinos, but only 140 of them were detected every day over the 18-month operation of this experiment. So that works out to about 5.8 times 10 to the 18 neutrinos, about 1 in...
So that works out to about one in about six million trillion total neutrinos that pass through the detector. That's very, that's a very, that's a very small amount. Now remember, 1.3 million trillion neutrinos pass through the Earth every second. So about 100 trillion neutrinos are passing through you right now every second as we speak. Neutrinos are rare. So neutrinos are rare, but they confirm our understanding of how the sun shines.